So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So I am Meg Bentley. I am um, the director of biology teaching labs. Uh, and I've been here for about four, this will be my fourth year here. Um, so the genesis of this interactive conversation actually is from, uh, I went to a meeting this past March or so at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Um, and the point of the, the meeting was it, was, it was called Finding a Cure, which is adorable. You have to have a good acronym if you're going to be in science. Um, so Finding a Cure, and CURE stands for Course-Based Undergraduate Research Experience. And so the meeting was all about um, a bunch of people who were interested in developing, implementing, uh, assessing, uh, getting funds to pay for development of these kinds of courses. And so it was very inspiring, but also there's a lot to sort of think about as you're moving forward um, as either a course a director or a department, um, sort of molding a curriculum, or as a college or as a university. So um, when I came back from that course or that meeting, um, of course there are tons of people here in American in the sciences, many of you I know, um, and work with really closely who are really into doing this and really invested in having this be part of our uh, science learning future. So I thought an easy thing to do was just to get our uh, community together to start doing this. So, um, so that's really the, the reason that we're all here today. So hopefully that's consistent with what we put in, in, the, in the little uh, manual, in the little handout. Okay, so our basic schedule for today is that our three panelists are going to give sort of a three-minute spiel on their experience, um, their take on uh, sort of developing active learning, active research in a lab course. Um, and then what we're going to, so that's going to be relatively brief. It's sort of just to give us a little fodder for our interactive conversation, okay? And then our interactive conversation is really going to, we want to talk about the present, what you guys have done, what you guys have tried, what's worked, what's failed, what we can do together, what you think we should think of going forward. So we want to talk about the present and then work into the future, okay? And think about uh, the future as a community, um, and um, as, a, as potentially being a model for other schools, because I think, um, a, and we'll, uh, this is part of our conversation, and, and we sort of like to end on this high note, is what is special about American University and the sciences that we can really capitalize on to really make ourselves a model for other schools. Cool? So that's our sort of ground rules or the thinking. I'm a pretty flexible person, so if we go off in some crazy tangent, fine. Um, but if we only get to that, Great too. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our three panelists. They're each going to give a little spiel, and then we'll jump into our conversation. So the first person who's going to talk is Nancy Zeller, who is uh, the court, who is my predecessor, and now is the coordinator of science teaching labs in the College of Arts and Sciences. And then Jonathan Newport is the director of physics teaching labs, and he's going to talk next. And then Matt Hardings is uh, assistant, assistant, assistant professor of chemist in chemistry. Okay, so you guys take it away. Yes. So um, I'm here to give you the historical perspective on doing science here on the campus. And I think I'm going to give Dave Culver credit for really starting that because he came up with the idea of having a lab director because the people in the department at that time um, couldn't really address the needs in the teaching lab. And, uh, and he hired me. And he hired me in 1991. So I've been here a while, and Dave Culver has been here a while, and we've been thinking about all this for a while. Now there are 15 people that um, have that responsibility of trying to get us all to do science in the best ways possible here. And um, those are the lab directors in each of the science departments, the assistant lab directors, and various term faculty that are also teaching labs. Um, so I'm just going to comment on four lab exercises that were developed during the course of my 20-some years being here that kind of reflect the direction of going into more research-based lab experiences for our students. When I first started, they really were all cookbook labs, they were handouts, and when we uh, tried this pun lab, we got a lot of resistance from the students because at that point in time, they were used to cookbook labs. So when we had them looking at and identifying um, organisms in a pond sample, maybe in different parts of the pond sample, they wanted to know which answers were right and wrong. They did not understand that 
whatever they saw was the right answer, as long as they understood that and why they were looking at it. Um, so uh, we progressed from there and uh, we uh, tried to make more of our lab exercises investigative. For example, with the yeast fermentation lab, it wasn't so much that sugar is necessary for yeast fermentation as much as what affects the rate of yeast fermentation. And you need to figure that out today. And what questions can you ask? What variables can you test? And how can you, you design an experiment to do that? And then write a lab report on it. Um, from that point, we um, started really trying to work with uh, research projects that were going on in the department. And uh, one of the first people that I reached out to was Vicki Connaughton, who uses uh, zebrafish, at, developing zebrafish as a model for studying the vision system. And um, with her help, we uh, developed a lab for the General Biology 2 class that um, students designed uh, their own experiments to test the effect of a particular variable or condition on the development of um, zebrafish. And we're all still using that model today in various ways. Uh, then from that point, um, and that, like I said, that was a general biology two class. We also uh, were working with David Angelini, I know a lot of you remember him, and he used milkweed uh, bugs as a model for studying the genes involved with evolution of those, um, uh, the sexual appendages, okay, of the milkweed bugs. And we actually designed a lab where we were designing, uh, we were following the evolution of small and, uh, versus large milkweed bugs, and we were growing um, <coughs> generations of these bugs and selecting for them. And we had the students in the Bio 100, so this is a non-majors course, measuring the milkweed bugs from these various different populations, gathering the data, analyzing the data, and, uh, and it worked really well. Un unfortunately, David left the campus, but um, it was amazing to see the Bio 100 uh, students also being really, um, getting really involved and feeling really good about what they were doing and learning more because it was an investigative, experiential type of uh, learning. So um, the last thing I think I just want to mention is all of these uh, approaches to um, experiential learning and using research are supported you know, with all the different types of research on education standards that are out there. The Common Core standards in K through 12 and the next generation science standards that are developed from those are, you know, based on open-ended, uh, problem-solving, uh, investigative, independent work by the students. And the AAAS and NSF, um, you know, all support these. With biology, we have a document called uh, Vision and Change that is excellent um, to work from. So I think it's really important that we're all moving forward today with this. Hi, I'm Jonathan Newport. Uh, so I think that one of, to add a little bit of a broader perspective to this, I think we, uh, as a traditional university, uh, might have some concern uh, about the forthcoming era of online classes and lectures and how that might uh, you know, detract from students from uh, coming to a, a traditional uh, university. And I would add that the one thing that uh, universities can do that they that you can't get online is lab, right? So uh, I am very concerned about adding uh, adding new new labs, an arc of labs uh, to uh, add value uh, to a university education. Right? So uh, talking about this this arc of, of labs, um, due due to the high throughput of students. Um, in the, it, the intro courses are necessarily cookbook to, to some degree. And by cookbook, we, we mean uh, that they're, they're given the table or uh, you know, they're asked to do a particular task or verify a, a particular equation uh, using you know, tools to measure physical reality. Uh, but that transition from uh, cookbook labs to the advanced labs and then on to research uh, is a is a difficult transition, and I think uh, the the best instructional experience I've had here uh, is in the uh, the one lecture class I teach, electronics one and electronics two, 
uh, it's, it's organized in, in a way that uh, we've got two labs a week and one lecture a week, so it's like two, two and a half hour uh, lab sections. And I, I really have been able to, having so much contact with the students in lab, so much time on task, uh, that I really see them going from <coughs> like holding their hands, doing these lab activities to being able to troubleshoot their own projects and now that they have all of these these skills uh, in you know both electronics and um, uh, additional skills added in the intro courses so for example uh, earlier I was mentioning in the, what, one of the things that we add uh, so I, I've been here for five years and one of the the big things that I noticed when I first got here was that the students didn't know how to plot in Excel. They didn't know how to organize a data table or anything like that. So I rewrote all of the, the labs to include, they, they don't have a data table, they have to generate their own data table in Excel. Uh, so they, they have to kind of like go through the organizational and analysis things necessary to make those plots. And uh, again, like I was saying earlier, <laughs> uh, students come up, I, and this was not anticipated by me, right? The students come up to me after, after these courses and they're like, I feel like I can actually get a job now because I know Excel. <laughs> like, that, that wasn't really the point of this whole course, but it's great. Uh, so anyways, in, in the electronics, at, at the end um, of the electronics two uh, semester, uh, half of the semester was dedicated to doing student projects. And so that was um, a, an amazing experience for me and I think this, the students as well, uh, coming up with their own uh, project and being expository, using all of these tools and skills to actually generate something on their own. And that's really the way I, I learn, right? I want, I have some end goal in mind and what are those things that I have to do and learn to get to that point. Um, sometimes students need to have their hands held and, and given the skills or told what to do uh, to before they can even realize you know, they're, they're in projects. So I think this is, it's a good stepping stone to more advanced labs and then again off, off to research um, and that's sort of what I have envisioned for an arc uh, in the laboratory sciences and physics. Hi, I'm Matt. Um, so in, in chemistry, we've, we've done something similar to what Jonathan just spoke about uh, in our upper level labs. Uh, so traditionally in chemistry, you have a cookbook labs that go along with your cookbook courses kind of so biochemistry and biochemistry lab analytical analytical lab and organic and organic lab um, so we got rid of all of our labs uh, the tr in the traditional sense and we replaced them with a two semester laboratory sequence and we decided that we we're going to base this laboratory learning environment around a student run research project um, and, and I'll, I'll give you just sort of the, the gist of it, um, and, and then I'll tell you about some of the benefits that we've had from it as well. So in, in the first semester, uh, we, we treat like a control experiment. The students are doing uh, some research that's been done before, and in doing so, they're, they're trying to repeat some research that's been done before. In doing so, you know, they, they learn techniques, so all of the analytical techniques we want them to have, and data analysis and instrumentation, and uh, different experimental protocols from that you might learn in biochemistry or in organic chemistry. So they learn all of those in, in, in the context of, of the control experiment and this grander project that we're working on. And the second semester then, and the second semester is really important, and this gets into the exciting part about what Jonathan said earlier. In the second semester, um, each group of students designs their own semester-long research project based on what we did in the first semester. So they, they take their first semester knowledge and, and the collective knowledge from this project that we've been working on, and they say, well, I'd like to take the project this way, or I'd like to take the project that way. And so we sit down and together we work out what's a reasonable goal for a semester-long research project, what are the experiments that we need to, to do, and is this project worthwhile? Is it something that other scientists may be interested in? And so the second semester is awesome, and I'm teaching the second semester of, of this course um, this semester, and I'm very excited about it as well. Um, but the students kind of, you know, they, they, they go off and they get really excited and really passionate about what they want to do. And it's funny when, you know, undergraduates designing a project, you know, they, they all say, well, I want to cure cancer. 
So do I. Yeah, yeah. Nice. literally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're not going to do that in the semester. And so really working with them to, to pare it down and, and say, well, how would you do it based on what we've been working on? All right, what are the first couple steps that you would do in that process? And then how can we prove that that's going to work, right? And so it's paring down that ambition from saving the world uh, to the, the route, finding the route that you would use to save the world, and then finding out what those first crucial steps are. And, and, and really going at those, those first crucial steps are, are kind of what a semester's worth of work looks like. Um, and the, the students just do a fantastic job. Um, the, the important part, I, I want to mention this too, the important part about all of this process is, you know, we have our first semester control experiment, our second semester student decides what's going on. At the end of each academic year, the faculty members who are working with this, we get together and we say, well, which projects are the most interesting? Which do we think have the best chance for success going forward? We'll, we'll pick one project or, or some compilation of, of projects from the, the student groups in the second semester, and we carry those through to the first semester of the next year. And that those become our control experiments. And so the project is always changing and evolving like any research project would, but it's due to the input and, and the research interests of our students. And so we make sure our students know that both at the, the beginning of the first semester and the beginning of the second semester, that these decisions either are coming from their predecessors or will go to the, the students who come after them so that they feel a real sense of ownership in what they do. Um, and, and, and that's sort of an important thing pedagogically to so autonomy and ownership. Um, but we've, you know, uh, some extra benefits to this. You know, we send students to research conferences to talk about our results. We've got um, one paper published, another paper that I've got out in review right now. Um, research papers, right, in big journals. Um, and, and I've just had a pedagogy paper um, accepted on this. So we, we see lots of benefit to this. Um, outside of just teaching, of course, right? This is this is scholarship that our department is doing, um, and scholarship that we're we're very proud of. All right, so now it's your turn. Maybe you've done some of this. Maybe you're about to think about doing it. I don't know. But I guess we want to hear some of your stories that sort of mirror the stories we've just heard. And if you can sort of describe what you've tried or what you've implemented. And then maybe um, talk about what you think really worked well, and then maybe what challenges or what hiccups you encountered along the way, if you did. Because I think as we start to tell these stories again and again, we're going to start to hear the same things over again and again. So what would be great is if we could sort of come up with, in this first sort of present part of the discussion, a list of sort of best practices and maybe challenges that we can think about as we're talking about the future. Sound cool? Cool? Okay. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Me? So, Matt, I won't um, oh. um, what you just described is really intriguing. The um, techniques that the students learn during the first semester, there are those things that all chemistry students should learn. It'd be cool to develop in biology, but we have a lot of different areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> so we, we do two things. Uh, that are important in that, that regard. The first thing that we do is that the American Chemical Society has this list of experiments that all chemistry majors have to, go, have to be exposed to. Uh, so we make sure that in, in crafting our first semester that they are exposed to those uh, different kinds of experiments. The other thing that we do um, is that in the second semester, the students have to show Part of, part of how we grade them, how part of our rubric for grading, they have to show that they can learn a new analytical technique. They have to show they can new, learn a new instrument. They have to show that they can uh, learn a new data evaluation technique to prove that they know how to learn something new. There's no way to cover breadth in any laboratory class, right, of all of the techniques that may, they may need to learn at some point or other. And, and so in our class, it's, that's even more, it's amplified even more so. So what we do is we show that our, our students are capable of learning these techniques on their own. And if they can do that on their own with technique A, they can do it with technique B. So that's kind of how we, we approach that problem. It is a problem that we, we think about a lot, but that's, that's how we approach it. Okay. So 
so what I heard for best practices right in there was selecting the right set of sort of a there modest are, list of skills modest or techniques that you really want students right. to master. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, ACS drives that for you guys. Yeah. What about uh, disciplines that don't have a governing body that decides that? How do you come up with that core set of biological, physical skills or skill sets that you need? And you know you can't cover them all, but is this something that the institution does, the department does, and well, I know there are or, there are associations like the Genetic Society probably has their set of topics or concepts. I would go maybe go to the societies, but I don't know. Do we as a department, as a biology department or a math department, or do, are those so beyond we do, learning? We do that because we're we are accredited. accredited. We have an accredited yeah. major. Yeah. Um, I think. Well, just because of the way the you know any research runs, it's likely that we're going to hit the types of experiments that they want just to have a complete project, right? To have a, a real project, something that we can publish on. You're going to hit on those. Um, I, I think if we didn't have the accreditation issue to think about, I don't know that we would necessarily do. Uh, Sometimes there there are some semesters. Last semester was one of them. Uh, that, that Doug Fox was in charge of. The, the projects that we took from last year, we were missing one key element. And there wasn't a good way to make sense of how to put that in, and so Doug had to come up with a way to do that. I don't know that we would do that if we didn't have the accreditation issue. And, and so, I mean, that's even something, too, that, you know, the, the, the way we do it this first semester is really it's really tricky for both the faculty and uh, it's really tricky for the faculty to get planned out to make sure that they're we're getting breadth and stuff like that. Um, but we try to let the, the project and the research dictate as much as we can, and that's kind of what we do. Uh, how many students uh, are typically in the first semester, and do all of the students in the first semester uh, continue on to the second semester? They all continue to the second semester um, for their uh, degree requirements they have. And how many students generally in a year? We have an average of 12. It's been as high as 17 and as low as 9. Are, Are there any about concerns 12? about scaling? Would, would you be I comfortable would, going to 30? I would love to have that problem. If we had that problem, if we had that. So these are juniors and seniors in this class. And so if we, if we could bump up our numbers, we could justify the need for more faculty members and, and things like that. I, I think scaling is a matter of having the appropriate number of faculty members in place. I, I think we can do this class with 20 students. I think that's feasible. The problem that we run into is having enough time for everyone to use an instrument in one, one period. Um, but you can get around that too by staggering the experiments that the students are doing. Um, but I think any more than 20 and, and, and we'd be in trouble. I think we can handle 20, but probably not more. Thank you. And so I'm Jessica and Angela. I actually teach at Hofstra, but Theo knows that we're doing a bunch of this stuff, and right. so I have to come visit. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering for you all, one of the things I'm really interested in pushing our faculty to do is do more assessment of our strategies and what we're using and getting yeah. quantitative data about the impact of these types of changes on our students. Is it actually helping them with their knowledge or their skills or their attitudes about STEM fields? So I'm wondering what tools either you all have developed or that you found useful, or are you using any tools like that to quantify the effect of these labs on your students? I've been talking for a while. If you guys want to go ahead, I have an answer, but if you guys can go ahead if you want. I'm going to put that as a challenge. Okay. So um, best practices are in green and challenges are in red. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, since, since I've been here, it's, it's sort of just been you know trying to put uh, patches on um, places that have, mm -hmm. you know, that we need dire help in, right? So, uh, for example, you know, the students weren't, didn't know how an oscilloscope worked by the end, and every physics student by the end of their undergraduate career doesn't know how to you know, operate an oscilloscope. Uh, so we do, we do have a few tests uh, that, we, that we give, and I do think the laboratory helps in, in these. One of them is called the Force Concept Inventory, uh, and the other one um, that I use is the Direct, and it does uh, it is an electronics test, and it's kind of like how current flows in mm -hmm. circuits and light bulbs and things like that. So 
Uh, and that's, yeah, that's one of the things I do actually is I give them uh, the, the theory and they try to answer it and then I give them an actual circuit that they can build and then they kind of like go through the reasoning for why it works the way it is and then they re-answer the question and of course they're much better after the experiment as opposed to just being exposed to the theory. Uh, so that's one, one thing. That I do. And those are tools that are, like that you didn't develop, but they're tools that's that are correct. available for people yeah. to, to yep. use it, I guess. So there, um, that, uh, along those lines, um, we, so Doug Fox, who is one of my colleagues, has done a lab practical with what we do. So there's one class where you know the students are given a problem, they don't know what it is, they don't know what it's going to be, and they see if they can they can do that. But I, I think that's that's fine. It shows sort of chemistry knowledge, and that's that's okay. I think what these kind of labs do better than anything else is they develop problem solving skills and critical think, thinking te uh, techniques. And and there are some standardized tests for that. Um, we have not implemented them. I wrote uh, an NSF proposal a couple of years ago um, for the pedagogy that we've been doing for the class. And, and there are some standard critical thinking tests and problem solving tests that you can administer before the class and after the class and see how they've done. Um, we have yet to do that. Um, but I, I think that that's the first thing that I would do um, is, is just do these tests. But you need, to, you need to go out and get training for how to administer the tests and all, all that stuff. Um, that, that I don't, uh, none of us in, in chemistry have been trained to do that yet, but we, we do need to do it. Yeah, and I, I don't know if this is the type of assessment that you're, that you're looking for, but I also implement a lot of practical, <coughs> and I, I think it's one of the innovative successes that I've had. Um, you know, I give two lab practicals during the term, and uh, that is worth, say, 25% of the grade, and their lab notebook is also worth 25% of their grade. But the only thing they're allowed to use on the lab practical is their lab notebook. And I saw like a night and day difference between uh, their lab notebook before I implemented this strategy and then afterwards. I mean, it's. So, linking grading for your grade, for your assessment, student assessment, to the skills that we're trying to teach. Right. Probably Which includes keeping up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we haven't done anything where we actually compare a lab that's that we want, to work, we have the same content and we use an experiential approach versus a non-experiential approach. I can't think of it. We're, we're not big enough to really do that here, right? We don't have the cohorts, right? The different set of cohorts to be able to do a, a full-on study. It would be nice to be able Biology to does. We're going to totally experiment with them. <coughs> or we, sorry, this is not recorded. Okay, experiment we can. That. So we have, we have essentially 30 section, 40 sections of lab in the fall. So we have 12 sections of a non-majors course that we run. So we could take a, a set of those, two or three, depending on how crazy we want, are feeling that semester, and, and really change it up and then do these comparison studies. But I, mm -hmm. I, I think that gets to something that four of us up here are interested in, and some of, some of you in the audience know about and are interested also, is how do we bring some of these mm -hmm. ideas into freshman, sophomore, introductory mm -hmm. level labs? What's that? And, and, and do it in an interdisciplinary way. Um, so with that, then we have the cohort members that you're, mm -hmm. that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. uh, two things. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, does Dr. Larkin's uh, survey of that class contain any data on these kinds of skill assessments? I mean, so we take before and after FCI data for everything. Uh, since, I, since I've been here, for every survey class, and had FCI data for that, so is that what you're asking? Yeah, I, I was curious if, if you knew if, if there was any question in that survey that might be applied, applicable to the, uh, the lab component as opposed to just the concept component. Uh, yeah, it's so inter intertwined, right? Yeah. Um, that, I, I mean, I think there, it's applicable to both the theory and, and, the, and the lab. I, I don't know that you can decouple, uh, you know, the things that are tested for in the FCI, which are just like Newton's Newton's laws, basically, um, you know, theory, theory from experiment, right? Um, okay, so um, I know half people up here know about this, but um, one of the things we did in biology this past year was change up the second semester introductory biology lab. Um, where before it was all, it was organism biology, essentially. 
So the first year I started, they just went through it each week. We did invertebrates, we did plants, and then they did produce. And um, all my students just, you know, they want to gather as soon as they can. So they just rush through, complete their worksheets, and probably didn't learn a thing. So then the second time we did it, uh, or second time we did it, I was involved. We changed it so that it was more like where they had transects and they had to actually like observe their transects and identify things and use different tools. And I thought one of the, the main, it was a challenge, but when I taught the same class in the summer, I think it was a really good thing was having them, um, you know, write everything down, basically a lab notebook. So that was something we hadn't done in the past. We had them do like worksheets and then it was just kind of one off. Um, but I feel like when we actually had them write stuff down and they really did learn it, in addition to having the experiential part of it and taking kind of ownership of that area. Um, so I thought that was one of the good things was that they were learning not only, like basically learning how to observe, and I learned to observe by having to write things down. It was something that I didn't really think about like in an open-ended way, not in like a, you must answer these 20 questions way. Um, but then one of the challenges we also had was um, like what was the format? So we decided for the sake of innovation and also simplicity of grading to actually have them do it. Uh, an electronic notebook rather than doing a physical notebook. But some of the other faculty, you know, are saying, well, you have to have a physical notebook because then you can take it anywhere. And it's like, well, you have iPads and phones too, so you can take those anywhere. But there's definitely like, so I guess one of the challenges is to try to figure out what's the best, best format, especially as things change. I mean, Te like technology wise. Right, technology wise. You stick with the old technology, you're writing things down, you know, with the pen. And especially as a, as, a, as a new scientist, right? Right, like what's I mean, going to serve these the, guys who are 18, yeah. 19, what's going to serve them 10 years from now when they're working? So the right, um, so dealing with, okay, <coughs> with changes in a discipline. Yeah. And when Maybe. we did it the first time, we had a lot of hiccups with the online software that we used just because we were learning it ourselves, but then the second time, it was pretty much flawless. I mean, it was great. And if they didn't, they figured it out enough so that everyone was able to write something down. And mm -hmm. even if they didn't write out the same format that we had prescribed to them, they still got everything in there and I was still able to see what they were doing and it was very mm -hmm. non-stressful. But the first time it was a little stressful because mm -hmm. no one really knew. This is the best way to go. Yeah. 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 There's a learning curve. There is. Yeah. <laughs> but that, there's a learning curve for life. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, okay. So best practice is thinking. So best practice be a scientist, like um, act like a scientist. To recording, recording data, recording data. Yeah. Okay. Because I think that was something that with the cookie cutter, if you just have them like do like a worksheet or just say answer like these questions, even if they do a lot for at the end, it's still kind of like, they still it's still kind of like that right answer yeah. thing as opposed to just observing and problem solving that they have to do if they really are actually recording on their own. Right. So, so yeah. Uh, al al along that along that line, um, so with these with these instructional labs, when you're building large amounts of data, right, you're doing research. How do you store that data? Um, and and you know this gets into you know the realm of library archival stuff and also um, <laughs> computer science, right? How how do you how do you store that data in a way that the people who need to have access to it can have access to it, um, and, and how do you how do you make that sustainable, right? So those are those are two big issues that I that I think are, are going forward in this. So so let me bring the perspective in from the mathematics side uh, because I've been running a mathematics project based class where it's not so much research that they're doing, but uh, the projects have. Uh, a set of beginnings. There's the data that is archived somewhere, right? Uh, and there's a goal where you're trying to go. We, we like, I would like you to do this with the data. And, and in order to do that, you're going to have to thread through these various tasks that exercise some of the, the material that I teach theoretically in class. Um, and one of the difficulties that has often been the case is, in order to do that, you need some amount of library of tools. Okay? Uh, and in particular, from a software standpoint. What kind of tools do you want to have available? Typically, I've taught mm -hmm. uh, through, say, for instance, using MATLAB. And the nice thing about MATLAB is it has a whole bunch of things that they don't have to worry about parsing files. They don't have to worry about, OK, it's an Excel file. How do I read that? Well, that's taken care of. Uh, but one of the challenges has been, well, how, do, how do we put everyone on the same level playing field? Some people are better at programming than others. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a programming class. It's, it's a mathematics class. We want to teach the mathematics. Uh, and what I've found, one of the challenges is how to balance that. 
from from the okay, this is a software architecture issue. I, I want to sort of help you do that where for someone else they may not have that issue. Yeah. So about so so there's two aspects. One of which is is making sure that they have the right tools available to manipulate the data. Okay, so just just, just from the from just which, a which which is along the lines of what we, what, what you guys were saying with with um, having enough time and equipment, yeah. equipment. Um, and that can come into an issue with, in the software side not having enough license or app for instance. Um, on the other hand, there's also the issue that if you're running something that's a bit more open ended, uh, you may have students that have that are in different difficulties of projects where it may be diff different mm -hmm. for them in mm -hmm. different difficulties with their backgrounds. So balancing the, the differences of, of difficulties of the projects with the difficulty uh, with the, their background. So is that a remedial issue or is that just a No, it's not a remedial a, issue a because because, difference issue. because it's it, it's it's not something that I expect them to know coming okay. in. Yeah. So okay. it's not an issue where they need remediation, okay. but it's an issue where they might need more support. Okay. Additional support. Uh, additional support in you chose a cool project that's great, but it's way harder than this person who chose something a little less ambitious. Okay. Um, to certain students, that to, sounds like. Uh, well, to, 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 to some projects. Yeah, to some projects. Okay. To, to some of the project cohort, yeah. Because some of them, some of them are just simply, this is something that's more sophisticated. Yeah. yeah. So going along with that, you know, when I, I wanted to ask you this earlier too, are these projects, um, research-based investigations done individually, in pairs, in groups, and what works best and mm -hmm. doesn't work well. Um, I can see pros and cons to what you're right. bringing up, to the size of the group. Right, I typically it, it typically run this in a small class, so it's you know maybe seven to nine students or something. And, and in that case, I, they do individual projects, but they also share ideas. Yeah, small, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, along the line of what you just wrote, I would add that matters, but it's doable within the time allotted. Okay. Pulling out what Matt said, I um, work with second semester freshmen on research projects, um, and I let them select whatever area of public health they're interested in during the research project. And my primary task is pairing them down <laughs> to what they can actually do in one semester. If they select something too large, they don't know where to start, and they become frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, so just mm -hmm. emphasize on that said. Absolutely. But that's sort of a 21st century skill, right? There's problem solving and then there's problem finding. And problem finding is probably just as important. Yeah. And they don't get any practice in doing that. So this is something like that. <coughs> so we made a, yeah. a very brief comment about how we kind of uh, can integrate this sort of mentality into the introductory labs and so something this may be a little bit premature to talk about it because I, I'm just implementing it this year uh, but I, I latched onto this article that was written in November that's called from cookbooks uh, to single sentence labs um, so the idea basically is that a truly authentic scientific experiment doesn't come with a manual right it doesn't uh, you're not your hand isn't held through these things. So examples of these types of labs, and the one the one that we're going to implement in just uh, two weeks from now is measure pi. Like how how, how do you measure pi? I, I want to give them just a sheet of graph paper and a compass so they can draw a nice circle. But then how do they find pi? Right? They have to like cut up the graph paper, uh, create an arbitrary system of units. And, and measure measure pi, right? And so how, how do they do that? And I think critical to uh, implementing a lab like this is a good instructor, right? So that feedback, the, the nice thing about cookbook labs uh, is that if you've got a bad instructor, the students can like get through it without, without the instructor. But I think we've reached a point where we've hired enough term faculty members, at least in physics, to teach uh, these, these labs uh, that you can have that meaningful interaction uh, and get real, you know, have a real scientific process going on in the introductory lab. So can I follow, because that's one of the big problems we're having is that, like, we had six sections taught by faculty in our intro course and 11 sections taught by graduate students. And there's a huge discrepancy in our ability to really get the students into depth. And part of that is a issue on our part where we don't give the students much pedagogical support. So we're working on that. But I'm just wondering how you all deal with that when you do have 
perhaps in biology, since you have more labs, more like adjuncts or whatever you call them here, how do you address that? How do you make sure that all your instructors are at a level that you feel comfortable doing these more interactive, experiential labs? There's been a huge effect just having term faculty teaching labs in parallel with them. Um, and, um, you know, it's just raised the, the expectation level for the quality of teaching for everyone. Um, and also, it also highlights how much importance is putting on their ability to come in and teach well. Uh, so the mental attitude that they come in to do the job has, uh, uh, you know, increased in their effort that they put into it has increased. So I will start there, but I want Meg to finish with what she ran on Wednesday. We are, we're, everyone's working on increasing the training for that as well. Um, so I, I, I would love to be able to say something really wonderful and uh, to address your question. And I think we're in the midst of dealing with that problem and we're trying to help our grad students get there, but I think at, at some level they're right above the, the undergrads themselves. And they and it's not that they like the skills, I think they yeah. lack the confidence yeah. to actually be able to be that yeah. that excellent willing instructor that they could be. Um, so we do, uh, we, we just finished up sort of a pre-semester TA training to sort of help them start to build that confidence and help them realize that that's what we want them to work toward, but in terms of sort of tangible things we've done to make that happen, we haven't really done anything. Although we've tried, we do have weekly trainings and we do have sort of half and half numbers and they get that sense at those trainings, but I, I bet if you ask them without us around, they'd be like, I feel like a pig on roller skates all the time, you know, which may be like being a scientist. I don't know, maybe that's good. But I think that's a, the scalability, right, in the instructors is really a challenge because you can get yourself overworked really quick. Yeah. yeah. But you shouldn't sell yourself short. I think the UTA program you're doing goes a That's long true. way. They, they may not stay <laughs> here, but they're going on. So you maybe you want to talk about that. Yeah. yeah, so we do add sort of, so in, in addition to a TA teaching a lab, we have an undergraduate <coughs> TA who's an undergraduate mm -hmm. who comes in sort of for half the labs. Um, and it's sort of the, not an assistant, I don't want to, it's a second person who g has generally been through the course themselves. And so has, it's a little closer to the students, but not, but a little older than the students. So is a nice um, intermediate um, level in terms of scientific confidence and skills and just maturity. Um, and that I think really helps the students taking the course say, so instead of telling the person that's grading them, I have no idea what's going on, they can go to that person. So I think setting up those things and making the environment, making it a safe place to fail is I think really important. And that's one thing I've actually thought about is should, so we, we've, we've taught, we talked about best practices of linking student assessments to sort of these skills we want them to learn, but does everything have to be graded? Does anyone do any like, hey, for the first three weeks, let's go have fun, because some, you know, you're not, you know, I, I, it's, it's sort of a weird thing to connect grading to all of these skills that we're trying to teach. I don't know if you have some experience with that in, in the first semester when they're sort of repeating research. Uh, most, most of the grade in the, the first semester is um, based on their lab notebook. They have, they have two writing projects, but, you know, the, the writing projects is, you know, they have to write like an intro to a paper, right? And so they'll write something, they'll give it to me, and we do iterations, right? And, and so I see, and we do the same thing with their lab notebooks. Because their lab notebooks are online, I can go through and I can read their lab notebooks, and I can see, well, they did this analysis wrong, or they're missing this bit of data. And I can write a note to them in their lab book saying, you need to do this, or you need to, to re reframe this in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and if they, if they do the, make those corrections, they do what I ask, then they get you know the, the perfect grade for their lab notebook part, right? And so it's it's iterative um, because we are we're trying to help them build those skills, not you know a, assessing some mm -hmm. you know right, technical proficiency or yeah. whatever you have, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll second that, especially for the mathematics side where 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 you're being in a lab in mathematics doesn't involve being in a lab and executing a skill. It involves producing some kind of written document, whether it be in English. Yeah. or yeah. software or whatnot. Yeah. 
And so I definitely encourage students, let's, let, until you've gotten it to the point where you're sure you're actually satisfying the goal, let's keep it ready. Yeah. And that's really crucial to getting any kind of success out of this. And I bet you this iteration part is tough. And that's exactly what gives yeah. me feedback about yeah. which students and which projects need more yeah. help. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. But then it's tough because you have staggers of students, right? And that yeah. leads back yeah. to so, 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 so you have some students who are, who are in a situation where, you know, they, 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 they've blown through. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I found helpful is, is to give, say, okay, great, you, you, you've, you've got demonstrated these skills, why don't you help your comment. Yeah. Yeah. And that works out pretty well. Yeah. Montessori lab. Hmm? Montessori lab. That's right. And you can just. Uh, <laughs> bang on <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we have them. Um, so, we, so, is there anything else? Because we have 15 minutes left and I want to talk about the future. Yes. I want to bring up one thing that uh, is not uh, relevant to a lot of the science labs, but is relevant to some of the biology labs. And that is doing labs not in the lab. Ah. We are woefully, inadequately field. Field. supplied to do field stuff field work. because mm -hmm. we don't have land nearby, we don't yeah. have equipment, we don't have transport, okay. we don't have so lack of support, uh, so administrative do support to do any of that. And I don't mean doing a whole... Do you mean well, like taking kids off campus, like, exactly. like, like legal? Putting them on a bus. Like yeah. okay. bus. I have to go and rent a 14-seater <laughs> bus and have to pay for it with my own credit card because I can't get it paid for through, you know, the CIS office and stuff like that. I mean, that, you just, it makes it impossible. You give up and you graduate uh, biology seniors who have never got their feet wet, dirty, or have never seen an organism in the environment. And I know that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an indoor people. biologist, is what I call myself. An indoor, but yeah, yeah no, you're not, absolutely it's right. It's not important for everybody, and for some disciplines, it's not important at all. But I think uh, yeah. having some no. support <laughs> for that would okay. be useful. Okay. Otherwise, those courses are, will go away, and, and those you, you, scientists change, will go away. you change the institutional yeah. direction yeah. with regard to that. And this is really relevant for environmental science, obviously, right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, uh, my discipline is computer science, and I've got an interesting perspective on this because I uh, am interested in figuring out how to give practical uh, problems to students mm -hmm. to develop code to solve them. Mm -hmm. And I've been bothering some people about this, and maybe I'll bother more people about this. That, you know, give me a problem in your domain mm -hmm. that might be amenable to being an assignment for somebody to write a program to solve this algorithm or to calculate this uh, ratio or whatever. But the second part of it, that's the question that was prompted by this discussion was also, when I get into a real research problem, time disappears and I can't do what needs to be done in the hour and eight minutes that the lab session provides. And so another part of my anxiety is giving a meaningful problem becomes outside of the class responsibility. Mm -hmm. And how do you balance that? How do you communicate that this is likely and it is going to happen and accept that that affects the amount of work you can do. Absolutely. So course structure, yeah. Not every experiment lasts two hours and 40 minutes, right? And it becomes voluntary. Yeah. Once you take it outside yeah. of the classroom yeah. and for the weekend we're going to go and go to a field station and do this, it becomes voluntary mm -hmm. and you can't have mm -hmm. assessment for it yeah. if not everyone can make yeah. it. And it just becomes a fun So then you can't tie it into all these really critical things that yeah. are fundamental. I mean, if you have no assessment for that part of it either. Okay. Or any way, shape, or form. So yeah, there are there are <coughs> restrictions. Like what we got over in one of my classes by um, making it compulsory, but at, uh, uh, in putting the cost of it into the lab fee, and so mm -hmm. the cost of the weekend away is built into it already. Okay. Um, okay. And the students know from the very beginning yeah. they they this is compulsory, blah blah blah. But I've only been able to do that for one of the several courses mm -hmm. that I've been that. And um, it's just yeah, logistically it's just it's just hard. Hard. Yeah. Really hard. Okay. Matt, how long does your class last? Uh, we meet twice a week and almost uh, almost four hours per session. Mm -hmm. 
four so, hours. So you have. So I'm, I'm so in there different. eight hours. Yeah, we're different. You're different. We. Not when, different. When, not different. It's it's a three credit credit class. When you look at when you look at the hours they spent in lab from before our, our curriculum changed and after our curriculum changed, they're spending less time in lab uh, overall, um, just oh, because really? of the different lab requirements okay. that we had. But he gets papers out. Well, that's that's the other thing. So do the students, okay. and the students go to give presentations, and that's part of how you get away from the assessment when you're rewarding students not with grades, but you know potential to write, you know, writing a paper or, or giving a talk at a conference or something like that. Um, then, then those benefits are, are, are better in my opinion. Cool. So we all, we have till twelve fifteen. So we've got ten minutes. So we just talk about the future in ten minutes. We can do it, um, or at least we can get started. And so, and I definitely encourage you to talk to the people in this room, this room during lunch. Grab them and go to lunch because I can give you some biology applications. Yeah. So that's actually a beautiful segue to the the sort of talking points that we want wanted to think about for the future. And sort of thinking about for the future, we sort of think about two things. Developing your own cure or you know, research-based lab course or put the research into the lecture part of the course. That's fun by me too. Um, and what can we do to sort of address some of these challenges? Um, and one thing that I think you just brought up it, with your point is this idea of working interdisciplinarily, sort of having um, departments sort of having natural um, connections between departments. And I don't know if you know this, but we're about to have a new physics building. When's that going to come online? Uh, supposedly fall 2016. Fall 2016. That's like right around fall the corner. Yeah. Right? Does everyone know about that? Yeah. So physics. That's why we can't park across the street. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> so physics, well, math, and computer science. Yeah. science. Yes. Uh -huh. So physics, math, and computer science. And then the dean, you know, and he, yeah, he came to Science Hours one day and said, uh, we're going to go to the, with the Board of Trustees and ask for a new science building for chemistry, ENBS, and biology. So these are sort of natural interdisciplinary, these are not, I don't think of these as walls, certainly, but think of these as your future, you know, neighbors, neighbors. yeah, hallmates, I was about to say, but that's very dormitory. <laughs> yeah, your future neighbors. Um, and I, I think everyone would say they're certainly happy to work across departmental lines. If you, if you want to set up something where we come and sit down and give you sort of applications from our fields, I would love to, I think that would be a lot of fun for me and for students to do. So I don't know if there are any tales of interdisciplinary curious success. I don't know if there's anything. But, um, but think about that in terms of addressing challenges and moving forward. And then I guess what we want to finish with um, is, uh, oh, and also if you're developing this stuff, come to this, I, I don't know, we have a Blackboard site, everyone's on it. Uh, maybe we'll start to use that to sort of, those things live forever. But maybe we can find some way to sort of get together every semester and sort of talk about this, about continue to have that discussion and help with development. I think that's really important. Don't go this alone because it's too hard. Are you going to talk about what we're doing? For the, you mean well, the AU? Or what, well, what, are, what are we doing? Chemistry, biology, EMBS. Yeah. Oh, are yeah, you why don't you talk about that for so, a minute? So, a minute. <laughs> so what, one of the things that, that we have started to do, biology has been great, they have their, their zebrafish thing. Um, in, in chemistry, one of the projects we're working on in our labs is building new water filtration uh, systems. And this is in our, in our upper level labs. I've been concerned with trying to figure out how to get that into gen chem, right? The 100, 200 level labs. That's what biology is doing with the zebrafish is in, is in a 200 level lab. And I talked to Christine and Angela over at EMBS um, about you know, thinking about how to, to get research into to what they're doing and hey, maybe we're all doing these research things. Maybe we can work on one big collaborative research project. Um, you know, there are lots of places with that, that try to get some research into, say, a gen chem lab, or some places that try to get research into a, a bio lab. Um, I, think, I think we here at AU have uh, a chance to do something very special by having one sort of interdisciplinary, collaborative, freshman, sophomore level, introductory level research project that all the students are involved in. And so a student can see a project, say someone who's pre-med, right, they're going to take chemistry and they're going to be taking biology. They're going to see both sides of this research. Um, so this is something that, that we have 
Um, I guess not, we've, we've more than we've gotten to talk about it. Um, uh, but anyway, anyway, this is, this is something that some of us up front here, and, and I know some of you in the audience are, are very hopeful for, for our future here at, at AU. So, sorry. Um, so just to be clear, you're thinking of creating a semester or year-long course that freshmen are well, choose to so go into to sort of have this interdisciplinary experience. I mean, totally think time is by. Yeah, so at the start, building in this collaborative research project into a couple weeks mm -hmm. of the semester for, so in chemistry, right, in Gen Chem 2, we want our, our students doing kinetics and thermodynamics. And so whatever project that we're doing, they're going to be doing some kinetics and some thermodynamics on it. And, and you know, the kind of idea that we have now is, is the kinetics and thermodynamics, <coughs> how fast does it take and how, what are the energetics of, what's the likelihood of some new polymeric material being able to, to get some uh, pollutant out of, out of water, mm -hmm. right? And, and in biology, we would be looking at how does that pollutant and what, at what levels does it start to affect the development of zebrafish embryos? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, within ENBS, one of the thoughts was, how do we, how do we model um, the uh, the transport of that pollutant into the water streams? Like if we're taking, if if we're taking birth control pills and dumping them down the drain, right? There, there's estrogen mimics and putting them into our wastewater. How does that get into uh, the fresh water that that uh, that animals and, and other ecosystems and, and us as humans have? How does that get into the water that we rely on? Mm -hmm. How do we model that? Yeah. So you're talking about integrating it to Bio 210, Cat 210, yep. and whatever the IBS course number. That's right. Okay. So, but and, and not having it take up the whole right. of the semester, like a three week, taking out a couple weeks, yeah, where where they're working on some of these projects and taking some of these measurements. Okay. It seems that that um, argument may also lend itself to sequencing, so that uh, in the fifth and sixth week, the chemistry of it is discussed, and in the seventh and eighth week, the environmental science issue is <coughs> implemented, in the ninth and the tenth week, the biology. It, it could be. I think it depends on you know any any real project that we come down with, right? And so um, the, you're, you're absolutely right in that. that um, but I, I think at the moment when we start to do this, it's going to be up to the departments themselves to figure out where does this best fit in. I think when we start to see some of the pitfalls and, and how these things actually work, I think that's a great idea to start sequencing them a little bit more. Um, to, to bring up these these pieces one at a time in our students and so on, in, in somewhat of a more logical progression. But in, in order for them to see all of that, they would have to take all of those classes. Most I, I would say that most of um, most of our chemistry majors, biochemistry or chemistry, are going to be taking bio. Most of the bio <coughs> majors are taking chemistry. Um, if if you're a public health and you're one or two pre med, you're taking both also along with. Physics. So they will see part of, but you're right, and not every student is going to be taking every, all of those. Classes. But they don't necessarily have to right. experience the entire project from beginning to end. Right. They have a three-week session where right. here's the data that's been collected from environmental science students or biology students right. picking it up in the field. Yeah. And, and they do their piece with it, and it's passed on to another event. I think I think that's a that's a great idea. Even if they are, you know, you can talk about each each discipline within your own discipline. Say I'm teaching a chemistry lab, um, but I know that that the bio labs had these results. When we're work, working on that in chemistry, I would say, listen, this is what bio the biology research has shown us. Some of you have been involved with this. Some of you haven't. But this is what we're trying to counteract. This is what we're. These are the the, the longer term problems that we're trying to solve. Is, is getting rid of this pollutant from the wastewater, so we don't have these developmental issues, right? And so I, I think that's cool. I think that's right. You can even bring students at the last week and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think cool. when you're developing these, you really want to keep those best practices in mind because iteration kind of gets lost in the trying to do a lot of different fields if you're trying to cover that just in one freshman <coughs> course, right? So I think it's just 
important to keep in mind what things are important in delivering this the best possible way. And you're going to be you, and then you, and then we have to go to lunch. One model that you might think about is like the university college model, where you have a cohort that, that gets identified, and you bring them in, and you run through uh, one semester doing that sort of thing. Yeah. They get a credit for it, and yeah. you do it up every Wednesday afternoon or whatever. The only problem is I think you might have trouble filling a science cohort every time with our current. And so not efficient, not, well, kind of true at the moment. Kehoe has uh, an NSF proposal to develop a UC system just for science students cool. that um, he and I have spoken you know, uh, and, and we would like this to be part of that. And even the, the honors, the new honors program too, sort of lends itself to that. Yeah. Yeah. But th there are two issues that come up with that. There will be multiple faculty, and there's always going to hit your head against the wall with regards to credit for teaching for multiple faculty until mm -hmm. they solve that problem. Yeah. And second, um, so you can probably associate with that. Um, it's gone. <laughs> for lunch. Okay. So I've written a draft proposal, and I'd like to propose um, taking the university college model and creating a one credit sophomore class for AU majors interdisciplinary, so it'd be an IEIS class. And you pick one professor, like you guys were talking about last summer, um, you pick a project like looking at pollution in the Anacostia or something, and you get biology and chemistry and maybe some physics and some public health majors all in that same cohort, mm -hmm. one professor working on it and allow the students to, to a certain extent, select the problem that they're interested in within that, that main problem. So basically what you're suggesting, like take it into the sophomore year, it hits a lot of different things. Um, it provided them with some techniques, so they learn some stuff, they get some investigational experience. Mm -hmm. um, it trains them to go into research labs later on, and for the pre-med students who need research but aren't really interested in it, kind of checks that box for them as well. I just remember the second idea. <coughs> People who teach in the honors and university college have to be taken, uh, usually do it on top of their teaching loads that they're doing before they have to be stolen from their departments and departments have to replace them when they're doing those sorts of so things. So there's also the problem associated with that sort of correction. Okay, okay so we'll have the to be continued. Thank you so Thank much. You, and have a good lunch. Have a good lunch.